Hello, you're watching Tell It Like It Is, and my name is Kathy Benick. Today's show is the third of a series called Race for the New Hampshire Senate. And this is a series of interviews with the candidates who are running for a newly structured Senate District 9 seat. Now, from 1985 to 2010, Bedford was represented in the New Hampshire Senate by Bedford resident Sheila Roberge, who all of us know. And after her retirement, another Bedford resident was elected to succeed her, and that's the current Senator Ray White, who a few months ago announced that he would not seek re-election. So now the race is wide open, with three announced candidates who will face off in the fall election primary. One Democrat, two Republicans. Making the race even more interesting this time out is the Senate redistricting. Now, previously, Senate District 9 consisted of Bedford, Merrimack, New Boston, Mount Vernon, Lineborough, and Greenfield. But now the new district has Merrimack being dropped from it and nine new towns being added, which include Peterborough, Dublin, and Jaffrey. So how much will the dynamics of all this affect the race? Who knows? Now, as I mentioned, right now, there are three candidates running for the office, two repubs, one dem. Still a few more days left for people to file, so whether or not that will change remains to be seen. But I'm happy to have today as one of my guests, one of the Republicans, and that would be Senator Andy Sandburn, who for the past two years has represented State Senate District 7. And now with the new redistricting, he's running to represent us here in the new Senate District 9. Andy was born and raised in Lebanon. In fact, he's the fourth generation New Hampshire native. Um, he's a graduate of New England College in Henniker, uh, where he earned his business degree and really focused and honed in on finance, economics, and marketing. After college, he spent 15 years working in New Hampshire commercial banking. In fact, he goes all the way back to the Indian Head Bank, which a lot of you will remember is one of the biggies. And then, he launched a corporate career out in Chicago, um, overseeing a very large international leasing company. Along with his wife, he's also been quite the entrepreneur. Um, he's been involved in several industries, including uh, research and development, manufacturing in the automotive industry, real estate development, and financial consulting. And a uh, man of many talents, he's also a small business owner. Um, he and his wife actually own The Draft, a very well-known restaurant in Concord that I've been to and can personally say, go on up, you'll enjoy. Um, he's on the board of directors of the New Hampshire Lodging and Restaurant Association, active with many, many different charitable organizations. As I mentioned, he has served in the state Senate, where he's been since 2010. And even before he was elected to the Senate, he became a leading voice in the state as a strong, strong and vocal opponent of the LLC income tax, which I'm sure he might want to talk about today. He's been married to 22, for 22 years to Laurie, um, also a very familiar face in New Hampshire because Laurie serves in the New Hampshire House of Representatives. Uh, so they're quite a couple. So having said all that, Andy, welcome. I'm so glad to have you here. Good morning. Thanks so much for having me. I appreciate it. Well, one of the first questions I just have to ask you, are you and Laurie at, at the moment, at least, the only married couple serving up in Concord? You know, we're not the only married couple because there are several couples. Yeah. But you typically find that those people are over in the house. This is only the second time in our state's history that we have a husband and wife who are in the Senate wow. and the House. So wow. it, it, it's a pretty special time for us. I would imagine, yeah. Now, I, I mentioned, I know you were really well known for, for the um, effort to, to defeat and income tax on limited liability corporations. Do you want to talk about that? Or? Yeah, Kath, I'd be happy to. I mean, okay. you, you know, that was a real important thing for me. Mm -hmm. You know, as a fourth generation native, as someone who's lived in the state his entire life and, and was raised in a real entrepreneurial family, um, we've always believed in small businesses. We've always believed in, in the entrepreneurism of New Hampshire. And when the state made the decision through the legislature to try and create an income tax solely on the backs of small business owners, you were, I was the guy that you know, led that effort and, and in the end brought together 3,500 small business owners and 30, 27 different advocacy groups and uh, forced the governor to repeal something that I truly felt didn't represent the values of New Hampshire. It was just anti-business and anti-economic growth. Was that kind of your first effort at, at a real big grassroots effort? Or had it you, sure was. Yeah? You know, I actually, you know, like, like most people in New Hampshire, 
I've never really been that political. Mm -hmm. I'm honest to say that I've, I've never had a sign in my yard. I'd never donated money to a candidate, except until about five years ago, when I woke up one day and just realized just how much you know, intrusion of government and taxation and red tape and regulation was really strangling our economic activity. Mm -hmm. So I became political at the urging of a lot of people because as my grandfather always said, you know, don't complain if you're not willing to take your turn and mm -hmm. don't take your turn unless you have some solutions. Mm -hmm. And with my background in finance and economics, I made that decision to, to try and help our state recognize what it needed to do to go back and start respecting the business community. So I actually ran for office in 2008 and was not successful at it. And it was early 2009 within that legislature that they came out with this new income tax just on small business owners. And I happened to be the guy standing at the state house at 11.30 at night when these politicians walk out of a room and say, hey, look, we've just you know, closed a $73 million loophole. Mm -hmm. And all we're going to do is you know, change how we tax LLC owners. Now, being an LLC owner and, and having mm -hmm. a background in finance and economics, I was very suspect of it, and when I looked at the document, realized that it was just going to be disastrous for the small employers of our state, and that really kind of kicked it off. Wow. And, and on the same vein, I would imagine you would be seriously opposed to any state income tax or sales tax. Yeah, i got to be honest. I'm, I'm known around the state house as the guy that, that, that's anti-all taxes, pushes back on regulation and red tape. That makes a lot of us happy. In, you know, I think it does. You know, I, I have vowed every single time, our state doesn't need an income tax. It doesn't need a sales tax. Frankly, it needs less money than it's operating with today. And as you saw in the last budget when I was a state senator this year, you know, we cut $800 million out of our state budget and still show that government can still be smaller and more efficient. Because remember, it's working with your tax dollars and it mm -hmm. has an obligation to be frugal with them and it still isn't quite there yet, but we're working on it. Mm -hmm. I, I know a lot of people feel as though there's a lot of duplication with state departments, state agencies. I mean, one that kind of personally comes to my own mind is, for example, the New Hampshire Highway Safety Agency. And you say, well, yeah, they do good work, they do good things, but by the same token as an agency like like that necessary when we have this giant New Hampshire Department of Safety. And I mean, that's just one example of, of many across the board. Now that you have that inside look and have seen budgets and so on, do you think that there is duplication of services and, and inefficiency oh, yeah. and such? I mean, there, there's no question. I mean, today our state has 68 separate state agencies. We have 11. That many? Yeah, we do. We have 68 agencies, 13,000 employees. And with just there's 11 agencies alone that that interact with the business community. The most disappointing thing I've seen as a senator, and I think the thing we need to work on most, is to really talk about you know consolidation of effort, reforming mm -hmm. how it's done, because we're still operating a state, which which I find just amazing to me that many of our state agencies still can't even take charge cards today. There's no way to interact with them electronically. I, mean, I don't want to say we're operating in the dark ages, mm. but we mm -hmm. have a long way to go. And, and I believe we can, we can really, really find some very significant savings and reforms. And in fact, I, you know, I have a piece of legislation that started with me putting in to actually try and consolidate a bunch of our state agencies. And for me, as, as you know, I'm a business guy, so I mm -hmm. focus primarily on the business agencies. So I have a piece of legislation I put in to try and start consolidating them to make it easier for the business community to operate. Mm -hmm. And we've converted that into a, a real comprehensive study on how we're going to try and reform the interaction between business and government. And we're in the middle of that study today. And if we can see this thing through, and I'm very positive, you're going to see some amazing changes. If I'm lucky enough to be elected again, mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm talking about hundreds of millions of dollars of reductions in expense to the taxpayer and still making it easier and more efficient for them to come in and operate. It's, it's a, we have some pretty exciting things on the table still. Now, are you getting much resistance? Because as we know, there are a whole bunch of sacred cows out there that people go hysterical when you talk about tampering with them a little bit. Yeah, there sure are. And, and you, you do find in government that p some people seem to have sacred cows. And for me, the sacred cow is the, is the New Hampshire taxpayer. Mm -hmm. It's the small business owner that's struggling with regulation where it's taking months and months and months just to get the approval to open mm -hmm. or expand their business. That's my sacred cow. Mm -hmm. That's the one that I focus on primarily. I mean, are we going to see kickback? Sure. I mean, we saw some kickback in the last couple of years when, yes. when we made a decision to yes. make a smaller, more efficient government but it was the right thing to do. And we, we need to stay on that path if we're really gonna try and make sure that everyone has a job and everyone has that economic opportunity that's so important to our families. We have work to do. And you know, I believe government, 
needs a cultural shift. It needs to convert from where it is today, which is turned into like a, a regulation agency. It needs to go back to, to a cultural position where it's encouraging responsible business success. And some of us as state senators are, are really working to try and make that happen today. Mm -hmm. and now, to be fair, I will tell you, I did not ask your opponents this who I've already interviewed simply because it wasn't like the issue. We can bring it back in and ask them again. Yeah, we will. Uh, simply because it wasn't the issue of the day. But as we all know, in the past, what, 48 hours, um, Wisconsin was international news um, as people tried to recall the governor who had taken a very, very strong stance against public unions and such. Do you see some of that? ultimately translating here to New Hampshire? I mean, honestly, Kath, I think it's already happening here. And, you know, as, as, as strong as a statement of, of, as Wisconsin was last week, mm -hmm. just as strong to me, maybe even stronger, was in the cities of San Diego um, and, um, it wasn't San Juan, uh, San Diego and San Jose over the weekend. And as you know, California tends to be a, a, a pretty liberal, yes. big government, big taxation state. Yes. So two of the top 10 largest cities in America made decisions to make dramatic pension reforms. So for me, Wisconsin isn't even as much about public unions as much as the taxpayers, the ordinary citizens who are struggling every day to make ends meet, be it Republican, be it Democrat, be it independent, libertarian, or whatever, have just realized that the growth and size of government today is just unsustainable. Mm -hmm. People just can't afford it. Now, as a state senator, that's, a, that's an issue that's very close to me because it's about allowing people to work hard and still be, you know, have that confidence that they can feed their family on Friday, they can send their kids to school, buy a house, mm -hmm. and maybe have a little bit left for retirement. Mm -hmm. That needs to be our number one priority. And for government, it hasn't been in some time, and I'm trying to bring that back. Mm. Yeah, no, I hear you. Uh, do you, you know, the, uh, one of the battles that continues is expanded gambling in New Hampshire, and obviously the advocates think that it will bring some good chunk of finances to the state. And then, of course, the opponents have all kinds of reasons why they don't like it. What are your feelings on it? Well, I, I think it becomes a complicated discussion. Because on one hand, I believe that if you're going to hold people's feet to the fire, mm -hmm. that everyone's feet need to be equal distance. Mm -hmm. If you're going to provide an economic opportunity, because our state doesn't believe in incentives, and frankly, I don't think we should, be, be, should, we should be using them, we should just be clearing the way to allow a level playing field. But when we talk about incentives in new industries, I believe it's very important that everyone's feet should be equal distance to the fire. Mm -hmm. So right now, a lot of the programs we're talking about are picking specific winners, specific companies to get licenses, and I'm not sure that's the New Hampshire way. Mm -hmm. On and above that, you know, people talk a lot about you know, it will bring more revenue into the state, and, and I'm very committed to the fact that our problem isn't a revenue problem, it's a spending problem. We generate sufficient revenue. In fact, I would submit to you, our state still brings in too much money and we should be pushing back on business enterprise tax and business profits tax and even local property taxes where we can because we need to make a smaller, more efficient government. So it's not about finding more revenue, it's about spending, spending less. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, obviously, transportation remains a big issue in the state. And yet, we, you know, we do know that the 10-year highway plan um, in it predicts a huge deficit to be able to fund all the projects that appear on the 10-year highway plan. How do you think that's going to get solved? Do, well, I mean, is, is the answer more gas taxes, tolls, what? Well, I'm a guy that, that does, not, as I said before, you know, I, I won't vote for any tax increases, mm -hmm. broad-based tax or not, because I truly believe that we're overtaxing people in mm -hmm. government's overspending. Mm -hmm. We have two problems with transportation. Our first problem is, remember, that 40 cents of every dollar that we collect to repair our roads and to, and to fix and maintain them we're siphoning off into other agencies. Mm -hmm. Continues to yeah. be a real big problem in our yeah, state. The diversion. Yeah. Right, that we collect all this money, but yep. the money isn't going to what it was intended to. So we need to get back and refocus that if we're collecting tax revenue, that's going to be used to build roads and maintain them, and it actually has to go to them. In addition to that, as you know, while I was in the Senate last year, we just actually approved some Garvey bonds, which are, or which are essentially anticipation bonds when the federal government sends its money back, and just really put a huge chunk down to try and expand 93 from Salem up to Manchester. Yeah. So as a senator in the Senate, we worked real hard to try and say, you know, it's really time to try and finish 93, get the job done. And I, I think the same thing here in Bedford. 
You know, there's been a lot of discussion relative to to Route 101 and Mm -hmm. and how busy it is and at what time and how much traffic is there that it's time to expand that. And if that's something the people of Bedford really want to see happen, I'm one of those guys that will will fight for that because that is one of the roles of government is to make sure the roads are right. The only thing I'd say to that is I think there are projects more imperative, in, and I, uh, I'm sure I'll be soundly chastised by some of our local government officials, uh, but there are other projects in the state that are certainly more needy than 101. Because, I mean, in reality, there's only a couple of times a day where you might have to sit through a couple of light cycles. Most of the time, you can just zoom up and down, Well, and, you know, and, truthfully. And, and that's where I see my role as a state senator it's to represent people. I mean, that's mm-hmm. the job, is that when, when people come and say, you know, this is what we want you to represent for us up in Concord. Mm-hmm. On one hand, you know, I'm the advocate that keeps the hand of government in Concord out of our local communities, because I really believe in local control. It's incredibly important to me. But at the same token, if there are priorities in our community, The job of a state senator is to be the advocate for that community and go up and fight their communities. And I'm proud to have done a lot of work in that regard. Mm -hmm. Here's one that a lot of people in Bedford, certainly, and and in the surrounding area is interested. Um, A lot of people really, really, really would like to see commuter rail expanded into New Hampshire, and a lot had happened on that. And yet the subject right now is, is kind of in limbo. Um, after the governor's council returned $4.14 million to the federal government, um, which effectively, you know, kind of stopped a lot of the preliminary work that would lead to that. Where do you stand on this? Well, I personally don't think that the $4 million should stop the conversation. It might stop your tax dollars going to to yet another study. And you know government's really big on that, you know, taking your tax dollars Mm -hmm. for this study or that study. At some point, you kind of either need to press the easy button or Mm -hmm. or get off the tracks, per se. Mm -hmm. You know, when it comes to the rail, I think most people would love to see something come in, but as a fiscal conservative, it's got to pay for itself. Mm-hmm. And until we can find a way where it, be cut, where it can become cost effective and does not become a burden on the taxpayers, I, I have a hard time supporting it. Mm-hmm. So if we can find a way or find some, some specific places, you know, Nashua has talked a lot about bringing rail up to Nashua. Mm-hmm. And if they want to do that and they can find a way to, that it will, it will fund its own expenses and operate itself, I, I'd, I'd be happy to take a look at it. Realistically, I don't know that any transit system is uh, totally supported by fares, though. Well, I think that's part of what we call the free market. You know, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, a guy that believes in the free market and be- mm-hmm. you know, and believes in entrepreneurs and believes in capitalism and letting businesses be businesses. You know, if there's a market, they'll build it, and if there isn't, they shouldn't. Because mm-hmm. remember, again, it's your tax dollars, mm-hmm. and you do you want to be spending your tax dollars on something that's never going to find a justification for the money? Mm-hmm. I hear you. I yeah. do too. Yeah, and and it is an issue, and it, I, I think it will remain an issue for at least the foreseeable future. I think it will as well. Yeah. Um, what about health insurance? Do do you think? Well, first of all, as a Republican, I will guess that I will know the answer to how you would answer this one. Um, do you think that New Hampshire should join the other states who are attempting to not? be forced to implement Obamacare. You know, there's there are so many problems with Obamacare. There are so many problems with the requirements and the regulation, the taxation, especially for like a small guy like me as a business owner. Right. In the 150,000 small businesses in, in New Hampshire, which I represent, mm-hmm. um, you know, I don't support that legislation. I don't support so much of the expense and, and overhead and red tape of it. Our challenge in New Hampshire, and and I actually introduced a piece of legislation for this. When I started my first business in in the state 22 years ago, Mm -hmm. there were 20 different healthcare providers, you know, all fighting Mm -hmm. for my trust in my business. It was competitive and our rates were low and they were affordable. Today, as a result of, again, actions by the legislature, Mm -hmm. we find ourselves in a place where there's only two and a half insurance companies and they're mandated by law to charge the same amount Mm -hmm. of money. I mean, I think that is fundamentally wrong. All of us, every single one of us, it, I, I'm guessing it, it's, if it's not the most important issue at your kitchen table at night, it's the second most important issue, is finding affordable health insurance. I actually put legislation in this le- last session to go back and allow us to start buying insurance across state lines. It was mm-hmm. Senate Bill 150. Mm-hmm. Feel very, very strongly about the fact that we need to reopen up the markets and allow for competition because if I, can, if I can sit at home and buy a car on eBay or mm-hmm. a, a book on Amazon.com, mm-hmm. 
pay for and have it shipped in with never leaving my desk, why is the state of New Hampshire today prohibiting us from being able to buy insurance across state lines? It's just wrong. And again, if I'm lucky enough to be elected, that will be one of my largest priorities is to get New Hampshire back into a market that finds competitive health insurance. Now, that bill was defeated this year, right? That bill was, unfortunately, right. ma'am. But it you know, can come back, obviously. Yes. And, 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 yeah. and again, if I'm lucky enough to come back, I, I will bring it back again. Mm -hmm. And it was defeated because there's, there's a constant argument or discussion of what we call um, adverse selection. Mm -hmm. That if you open up new insurance pools, well, the healthy people run over to one and therefore let, let the other one be left to people who are less, less healthy and driving up their rates. But I'd submit to you that today, our adverse selection is so much worse because people can't even afford to have insurance today. That's it's right. The, it's the last thing you want to yeah. give up, but I truly believe, and, and Senator Ray White and I fought very hard for this piece of legislation. So many people today can't even afford health insurance. So when we talk about adverse selection, the, mm -hmm. the adverse part today is all these families that are dropping off the rolls because mm -hmm. they can't do it. We need to establish some health insurance where, where, where young kids who think they're gonna last forever, mm -hmm. you know, might want just a small catastrophic policy that's really affordable. And people like me that's had some health issues, I'm gonna buy the big Cadillac plan because mm -hmm. I need that full service plan. So it's something we can fix. It's something we have to fix. It's something I know if I can get, you know, gain people's trust and get reelected to the Senate, that we will fix next time and we'll find a way to make cheaper insurance. So it's safe to say that you would support various regulatory changes too that kind of hamper. Anytime I can find less regulation, that's better <laughs> regulation. Um, just again, in the past few hours, practically, um, we learned that the effort to put on the ballot for all of us to vote on to return education funding decisions back to the legislature and away from the courts failed. Yes, ma'am. Where are we going next with that? Well, you know, I, I'm proud to say, you know, in the Senate, this year, and, and, and I'm not someone that picks on the House of Representatives because, as you know, my wife is in the House, but sometimes we have nice, fun, healthy debate about it. Oh, you must have some very interesting dinner conversations. We have some, we have some, <laughs> great, we have some great dinner conversations. You know, what I'll say about those of us that were, that were lucky enough to represent people in the Senate this year, you know, we passed a constitutional amendment yes, to, to fix education yeah. funding. We passed a constitutional amendment to allow people to see if they want an income tax or not. Yes. We passed a constitutional amendment um, that would require a supermajority of the legislature to raise your taxes. Yes. I mean, for, I, was yes. actually, I was actually chief negotiator on that one. Was Were real, you? Yeah, yeah, I was. Yeah. Really proud of the work that we had done because I believe the people have been very, very clear over and over. They have this, like I do, honestly, have a healthy distrust of government because mm -hmm. they continue to make these promises and walk off on them. Mm -hmm. and, and I believe it's time for people like us, traditional New Hampshire Yankees, new, uh, you know, people who tend to be conservative, who make a promise and keep it. I made this promise that I would not vote for any taxes or any fees. And the people of New Hampshire don't want to see this out of control government mm -hmm. with new taxes and new fees continue. And so on the Senate side, I think we've done some really great work in, in doing what we said we would do as it relates to keeping your taxes low. What do you think will happen next now on this, on this whole issue of on, 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 the court on, control over on, on educational funding, spending? Um, Again, you know, just like with the IB challenge that we had in, yep. in Bedford a little while yep. ago, it's about local control. Mm -hmm. um, you've heard me say it before in this interview, would I say mm -hmm. it pretty regularly? I'm a, I'm a phenomenal proponent of local control. Mm -hmm. The court systems with, you know, with the Claremont system itself and what was called CACR 12, which is the Educational Funding Amendment, which, which did not pass in the House, there are some things I believe we can do legislatively okay. to really help bring control back to our communities. And a number of people will continue to fight the fight to try and find language that, that re-empowers our local communities and re-empowers the legislature to have its, have its voice over education and take it back from the courts, because really, it's the court's place to interpret the law, mm -hmm. not to make them. Yeah. And this is a place where they overstep that boundary, and, and we should probably rewrite that ship. Well, I am looking at the clock, and as with all interviews, the time just flies. It does. So what I'd like to do is give you a couple of minutes to bring up whatever topics you feel are important and to look right into that camera and tell everybody who's watching why they need to vote for you. Well, in the fall election. Thanks so much, and thanks so much for allowing me to come in and talk today. Again, you know, my name is Andy Sanborn. I'm, I'm a fourth-generation New Hampshire native. 
Uh, I'm a lifelong resident of this state, small business owner, and a guy who was helplessly in love to the same girl that he's been married, mar married to for 20 years. Yeah, I never wanted to become a politician, but as a business owner, as a husband, as someone who, who cares so deeply about our state, I think it's time for each one of us to take our turn. There's no question, I have a background in finance and economics. That's really what drives me, keeping our taxes low, pushing back on, on regulation, trying to clear the way so we can make sure that New Hampshire is the best place in America to live, work, and play. We have a lot of challenges in front of us. Sure, we've accomplished a lot, and I'm really proud of what we've been able to do, but there's still some more work to do. And if I'm lucky enough to gain your support, you're gonna find some great things, from buying health insurance across state lines, as I had indicated, to truly making a smaller, more efficient government. With some of these committees that have started and this legislation I've worked on, we can really make New Hampshire the best place for you and your family, and I'd love to have your support. And again, thanks so much for the time. Wow, you're good. You can't look at, we still have time left. <laughs> <laughs> I well, can tell you've been interviewed before. Once or twice. Well, let me ask you this then, as long as we have a little time left. If somebody said to you, Andy, in the time that you've been in the Senate, what was the thing that you are the most proud of? What would you answer to that? I'd say it's representing people. Um, you know, I'm known as a guy that tends to be pretty consistent, which is one of the things I love. You don't see me flip-flopping or changing mm -hmm. directions. But it's been an incredible honor. It really has just to, to represent people and, and do that constituent service when, when they call up when they're having a challenge with their government or having challenge with one agency or another or, you know, or bringing home pieces of legislation that are important to people. It's about representing. And, you know, I got involved because I felt I wasn't being represented. So mm -hmm. it, it's, it's very dear and close to me to make sure that, that we're there for people who need the help. Well, let me ask you this. Are you available if people want you to come out and speak to their group or if they want to invite you into their home to Absolutely, as I've always said. Do I mean, all those it, kind it, of things? You know, I have a website called andysanborn.com. Um, See how good this guy is? Would, He's would, would, a pro. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, would love to hear from you at andysanborn.com. My email address is actually andy at andysanborn.com. And as a politician, I'm one of the rare ones. I actually give people my cell phone number. I was just going to say, I, do you want to give I that do. too? You know, uh, something I've always done because yeah. since I've become active. And uh, my cell phone number is obviously 603 because we're in New Hampshire. So 603-682-1165. Would love to hear from you. If you have any questions, comments, or concerns, um, happy to try and help you out to the best of your ability. And again, thanks so much for your time. Well, you know, for those folks who maybe just ran for a pen and, and missed it. Do it again. We will keep putting that on the screen. And at the end of the show, in the credits, that info will be up there too. Great. So yeah, that way they'll know how to reach you. Well, look at that. Did we come in perfect or what, huh, time-wise? You, know, you know, like a couple of good traditional New Hampshire Yankees. That's right. Tend to be incredibly frugal with both our time and other people's That's money. Right. <laughs> but this, this is how we should wrap out shows, letting people know that we're trying to be good with, good with their stuff. You got it. Well, thank you, Andy, for coming in. Thank and you so I'm much. sure we'll see much of you in the coming weeks. Awesome. Thanks so much. I really appreciate it. Everyone, thanks so much out You're there. You're quite welcome. We'll talk to you soon. And to all of you who are watching today, Thanks again for watching and keep on telling it like it is. Till next time, bye-bye.